Okay, here we're looking at population distributions. If you look at this image and the apples in it, we could look see how they're uh, distributed. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of a random distribution. However, if we look, zoom out from this one particular image and look at the entire field, we'd see odds are these apples will be concentrated in one area. So let's look at population distributions in a little bit more detail. First off, we gotta look at a normal population distribution. If we can look here, we see as we increase n, or the number of individuals, we see a more defined, what we call a bell curve here, with the odds are, or normal, average being right here in the center. And again, n of 4, we see it increasing, we see a little bit more of a defined characteristic at 16, to 32 to 64, now we're really getting a sense of this normal distribution curve, often referred to as the bell curve. What this means is the average will be here in the middle, and 34.1% will be one standard deviation to the right, and 34.1% to the right, uh, to the left, I should say. And as we get further away, we see a smaller percentage. So there's a very small percentage that would be way out here. Same thing here on the other scale. The way to think about this would be height. If you were to measure height of a bunch of individuals of the same age, you'd have a couple really tall people, a couple really short people, and the vast majority of people being in that normal distribution or close to that average height. Now fish populations distribute over a temperature range. So again, we're looking at population distributions. Well, how water temperature influences fishing for small pelagic species. Bluefin tuna and mahi-mahi or dolphin uh, are pelagic species. In normal conditions, we can see most of the fish here are about 50 meters down uh, from the surface. But during an El Nino, where we have that increased water temperature, these pelagic species enjoy a certain water temperature. As a result, they'll be found much deeper in the water column. In this case, if we're um, a fisherman here using a net to catch the fish, you can see during normal conditions, no problem. Well, but during El Nino, because those fish go deeper, seeking that similar water temperature, then that is ineffective in this example. Now, specific population distributions. We have something here called random distribution. It occurs when there is no competition, antagonism, or tendency to aggregate, which tends uh, to be rare. So this random distribution, you can look at the hillside here. The uh, presence of conifer trees is random. The presence of maple trees is random. Uh, oak trees is random. Uh, and it kind of looks like this. It's kind of like you took a bunch of marbles and just kind of threw them out over an area. It's a random distribution. Here we have a uh, uniform distribution, which results from intense competition or antagonism between individuals and tends to be rarely found. You can see here with the penguins, pretty much all evenly dis uh, their distribution is very evenly spaced, kind of like students in a class. You can see they're all kind of like facing here, like we're viewing from the teacher standpoint. However, uh, we don't see, we typically see in classes, kids talking or on their phones. Uh, and we see kind of most of the penguins here nicely facing uh, the camera here, paying attention. Another population distribution would what we call clumping. Uh, this is the most common distribution because environmental conditions are seldom uniform. Reproductive patterns favor clumping, and animal behavior patterns often lead to congregation. We see that here, there's kind of like little clumps of these particular organisms. The optimum density for population growth and survival is often an in, in intermediate one. Undercrowding can be as harmful as overcrowding. So we want to take this into consideration. We're looking at populations. Too, we often think of the negatives being too many organisms in one area. In certain cases, undercrowding can also be harmful, uh, where there's too few individuals in an area. Looking at population dispersal, we're looking at the spread of the Africanized honeybeans. We see them evident here in Texas, and then spreading outwardly. So the question is, how can you explain their success in expanding their territory, these Africanized honeybees? Well, looking specifically at our population dispersal, why are they originally brought um, to Brazil? Well, researchers brought the African ice honeybees to Brazil in the 1950s in an attempt to improve productivity of the Brazilian bees. So these African ice honeybees were brought to Brazil. We see they've expanded well beyond that. They are originally brought with good intentions. However, how can you explain the success of expanding their territories? We see them started to move into Mexico and then into Texas and into the southern regions of the United States. Well, African ice honeybees produce more offspring. 
They defend their nests much more fiercely in greater numbers and are more likely to abandon their nests when threatened by predators or adverse environmental conditions. So these are just a couple of the ways to explain how these Africanized honeybees have been able to vastly increase their population dispersal. The population growth rates, the increase in population during a period of time expressed as a percentage of the population at the start of that period. It reflects the number of births and deaths during a period of time. Now we can see here the average population growth. Notice here Germany and Japan, they are below zero. They actually have a negative population growth rates, which means that they are, every year that goes by, their population is decreasing. So it's possible for population growth to be negative here. Something we want to consider when we want to look at the average uh, and if things are well above or below that average, how that may influence uh, the world's population and how it may influence the resources that we use on a global scale.